What is up, my friends and fellow busy bees? Welcome back, or if you're new here, welcome. My name is Mel, and I'm a full-time furniture refinisher teaching you how to bring new life to the old and unloved by letting you know my best tricks for doing your first furniture makeover, turning it into a hobby or side hustle, and sharing my experience going full-time and the behind the scenes of the business aspect of furniture upcycling. Today, I want to bring you a shorty episode telling you some of my best top coating tips, tricks, and hacks from my experience since doing my first furniture makeover. There is definitely a lot of conflicting and probably overwhelming information out there about the best way to approach different types of top coat, whether you're doing a polyurethane that's oil-based, that's water-based, a wax, a polycrylic, an oil, or some other form of top coat. And I've tried a few things out over the years, and I have a pretty good system now, what I think is a pretty nice, smooth finish. I have had people tell me that they thought that I sprayed my pieces, which to me is a total compliment, because I do not, typically. And a sprayer is, if it's being used right, typically the smoothest, best finish that you could get. So that tells me that I'm doing something right. I will say that top coating takes a lot longer now and a lot more intentionality since getting the new love of my life, Yukon, our now one-year-old Bernese Malamute puppy who is wonderful and cute and rambunctious and also sheds incessantly and somehow gets that hair everywhere, including in the workshop somehow, even though he has been in there maybe twice without permission, I might add. He just snuck in there. But that was months ago, and there's still hair in there of his, so I don't know what he's doing. I don't know if he has, like, a covert operation trying to sneak it in. I assume that it's probably on my clothes at any given time, and that's probably how it's getting in there. But probably every other time that I go to top coat a piece, I will look at it and see a couple of hairs in there that I then have to wait till it dries, go in, smooth it out, and then re-top coat without hairs in it. So just a little tip if you're planning on getting a dog that sheds and you do this work, um, make sure you have a strategy for that. So I've mentioned on the podcast before that my preferred top coat to use is a water-based polyurethane. I have used polycrylic in the past, but I find that it doesn't dry quite the same. It doesn't self-level in the same way. And there was always like little bubbles that would be left in the finish if I didn't go over it like a million times while it was drying, which seems counterintuitive to me. So once I tried a polyurethane and I didn't have to do that and it was more self-leveling, I was sold. I have definitely used a few different brands and switched out kind of my favorites or my preferred one over the years. The one that I'm currently using that I've probably been using for at least six months consistently now is the Bare, uh, I think it's called Fast Drying Water-Based Polyurethane. I get that at Home Depot and so it's really accessible to me and it's Uh, around the same price as most are and I've tried it in its flat satin and semi-gloss finish and it works beautifully so that's my go-to right now and I've heard a lot of different recommendations over the years of what tool is best to use a lot of people like to use a paintbrush which I have done in the past every now and then I do or I'll choose to do it on a certain part of the piece like if there's any kind of small crevices or details that a roller wouldn't be able to get to I will do those with a brush and then I'll do the larger flatter spots that are easier to get to with a roller with the roller and in terms of paint brushes I like to use one that doesn't hold a whole lot of product because I like to do multiple thin layers and build it up over time rather than trying to get a thick finish from the get-go and that goes for when I'm painting but also when I'm top coating because that will just ensure that there's no drips or pooling of product that won't look as good once it dries and also I find that when product ends up pooling in those little details depending on the color that you painted it or if it's, I guess, a stain as well. The polyurethane dries kind of like almost to a yellow tone, even though it's clear when it dries on the rest of the piece. If there's that pooling, it can kind of start to look yellow if it's on a lighter color, and so it just looks dirty. So I use the Dixie Belle, the Bell brush most often, 
both for painting and top coating. I just like the way it feels in my hand. I like the bristles. They're very compact. They're tapered. It just works well for me and then I don't put too much product onto it. In terms of rollers, I prefer to use foam rollers over a microfiber roller and I have tried both. And I currently have both and every now and then I'll be like, you know what, maybe I was just doing something wrong and I'll try out the microfiber roller again when it comes to paint or top coat. But for now at least, I'm preferring a foam roller 10 times out of 10. I don't know really why people use microfiber rollers. Maybe I'm doing something wrong and I'm overworking the product or underworking the product, but I don't find that it puts the right amount on. I find you either get too much or not enough and then it doesn't level the product out in the same way. I don't know. But I prefer the foam rollers. I find they're also less expensive. I get a pack of probably one, two, three, four, five, like 12 from Home Depot for like, I don't know, $12 or something. And I use those rollers multiple times as well. I'll clean them, dry them, and then reuse them. Unless I'm using a oil-based product, then I'll usually just toss it. So those work out really well. And I have also heard people in the past say to wet your rollers before using them. I don't know if that is a recommendation specifically for a microfiber or a foam roller, but I will say I do not wet mine first. And if a roller is still a little bit damp from when I used it previously and cleaned it, I will grab a new dry one. It definitely probably uses up more product because it's absorbing more because it's so bone dry. But I've had it in the past where I have grabbed one that still had a little bit of moisture left on the inside. And then when I went through, I think it was with a top coat that I did this and I rolled it on, that moisture came to the surface a bit and then kind of made it like a little bit bubbly, I will say. Like it integrated that moisture into the top coat. So the product was no longer the way it was intended to be. And it just had a weird kind of look to it. So moving forward, I was like, okay, dry rollers only. And like I mentioned, I'll do multiple thin layers of polyurethane instead of trying to get a really thick, dense finish from the get-go. So on most pieces, I'm doing three layers of polyurethane. And if it's something that's a lot more high traffic, like a dining table or a kitchen table or something that's going to get that wear and tear on kind of a daily use, I'm going to do on average probably five coats. I would say at a minimum you should be doing two coats because the first layer probably looks nice, but the second layer is really going to even out the finish and the look of that finished product. And then as well, if you have any spots that you maybe missed or it was a little bit thicker of a finish in one spot, you can see it on an angle that there's a little bit of glare on one spot more than the other. Having that second and third layer is going to then just even that out so much more and you can perfect that rather than going back and trying to fix it while it's still damp, which is another really important tip. If you are going through, let's say you're using a roller and you are going through a piece, say you're doing the top of a dresser, you're going back and forth, end to end, I recommend doing long, even strokes versus doing short ones, like, you know, covering a third of the piece width-wise. Wait, no. A third of the piece lengthwise but covering the whole width of it and then going through and doing the middle section and then the end section do long sweeps from end to end and that's going to give you a much more seamless finish and I also recommend overlapping each stroke just a little bit so that again you have that seamless finish but if you're going through and say you get you know three quarters of the way through top coating that piece and then you look back to where you did your fir- first stroke across the piece and you notice that you missed a spot or maybe there's a little bubble or sometimes you'll see like a piece of dust or a dried piece of product that was maybe on the rim of the container you pulled it from and it got on your roller or something like that. Maybe you have one of Yukon's hairs in near finish. You're going to leave it. The perfectionist in you is going to make you want to grab it out and get it the second that you see it and then go back over that spot. But because you didn't just immediately put that product down a second ago, it's going to already have started to set up. And even if it doesn't look like it's dried yet or it's gotten tacky or anything like that, it has. It started to do its thing, especially if it's a fast drying product that you can do a second coat within an hour. Like once you put that product down, it's starting to set up. So just let it dry. 
even if it's a big chunk of something that's in there, that is very easy to either sand out after or sometimes I'll just grab like a little razor blade or a carbide scraper blade and lightly scrape parallel to the surface of the piece to get that chunk of whatever it is out or to kind of like slice it in half if it's just a little bit of a bubble or something like that and then you can lightly sand it with a high grit sandpaper and I promise you once you go back in with that next layer of poly you won't even be able to tell that there was an imperfection there but it can start to get messy and look a lot less seamless if you go back and you start screwing with it before it has properly dried. And like I said a light sand in between each layer of polyurethane is my next tip. Even if it honestly looks like crystal clear, it looks perfect, and you're like, okay, I want the next layer to look exactly like this, so I'm just going to go in with the next layer and not touch this one. No, go in high grit sandpaper, like I would say 300 plus grit, and just lightly sand. You can do little circular motions or end to end back and forth, whatever you prefer. Then go through with a clean rag. You can have it lightly dampened if you want, just nothing wet. And then go in and get rid of any of that sanding dust. Let it dry thoroughly if it was damp. And then go in with your next layer. And that's going to make it just a really buttery, smooth, clear finish. And I know I had been worried about doing that at the beginning because I was like, well, if I go in and I sand it, even if it's super high grit and light, it kind of makes it look a little bit cloudy when you go in and you sand it, especially if you're doing circular motions. So I was like, this is obviously stupid and counterintuitive. And why would I do that? Because now I'm screwing up the finish, right? But I don't know what the science is behind it, but it doesn't do that. Another tip is to let the product fully dry before you determine your next step because there have been certain top coats that I've used. Actually, the one that I use right now, the bare one, is one that does this. While it is on the piece, before it has dried, it looks like it's milky and kind of has like a blue tint to it, depending on the color that it's going over, or a pink tint to it. And it kind of now looks more pink in the container as well. I actually had somebody comment on, I don't know if it was an Instagram or a TikTok or something, where I featured this product in the makeover. And they said, I just bought this, but it looks super pink in the container. Is that normal or did I get a, a dud? And that is normal. I don't know what they changed about it recently, but it does have a bit of a pink hue to it. And when it's on the piece, I find it looks a little bit blue in tone, but it dries perfectly clear. I'm sure it has something to do with color theory and like neutralizing certain tones in the colors or something like that. I don't know, but it goes on clear and I've had it with other top coats as well where it might look a little bit yellow or just that cloudiness, especially when it's over darker colors that makes you panic a little bit and be like oh my god I should stop doing this or I should just take it off or I should put my roller over it a bunch of times because it's obviously not going to look good and I'm going to have more work trying to remove it and redo it and that kind of thing but just let it dry thoroughly because 99% of the time it's going to be a clear good finish once it has thoroughly dried it just might look a little sketchy before you get there. And when you are top coating over a dark color, I'm going to say more so when you're using a matte or a flat finish because there's an additive in that top coat sheen to remove any sheen in it to make it more flat and matte. They add something in, I believe it's talc powder. And basically if that's not thoroughly mixed into the product via mixing it with a stir stick for like multiple minutes before you start using it, to make sure that every single morsel is mixed in thoroughly and the sediment is thoroughly mixed in, then sometimes you'll get a bit of a kind of like a cloudy or patchy look to it even after the top coat has dried. My recommendation if you have this happen or if you have a product that you know this has happened in the past, again go through, do your light sanding in between and then for the next coat I want you to get a separate container, pour some of that top coat in and then put a little dollop of the paint that you painted that piece. Again this is typically seen in darker colors because you don't necessarily notice it if it's over something super light or white but 
for navy blues, for blacks and grays that are deeper in tone. I find that this happens and if you just put a dollop of that into the top coat, mix it in super thoroughly so that everything is incorporated and then go through and do your next layer. It's going to look weird. It's going to look like the color isn't what you made the piece be, like not the paint color. It's going to look a little bit lighter obviously, but once it dries, it just makes it crystal clear. I don't know why, but it must give that talc something to adhere to or something. Just help tint it a little bit and it gives you a beautiful finish. But again, that's specifically with a matte or a flat top coat that I've most commonly seen that happen. And now if you're applying a polyurethane, there's other options of ways that you can apply it. I have a kind of like a handheld sponge top coat applicator that I've tried in the past and it works nice. I'm pretty sure with that one, I actually did moisten it a little bit before using it but made it so there was nothing when I would squeeze it that would come out. Like that's how moist, sorry for saying moist, that it is. It's just barely has any moisture in it and it just helps it glide over the piece a little bit more smoothly. Or you could be using a sprayer as well. And sometimes you have to work through a couple different products to find one that works well for you and your style and the finish that you wanna see on your pieces. And to just be real for a minute, If you are someone who tends to be a bit of a perfectionist and you see these pieces online of people and it looks so flawless and so perfect and you can't quite get yours to look like that, just know that social media is not always real and cameras don't always pick up on the small little imperfections that there may be on a piece. It is totally normal, especially since we're working with pieces that were destined for the landfill. They're not always in the best shape too, so don't get hung up on it if you can't get a perfect finish on every single piece that you do. If there's a little minor imperfection or, I don't know, you can see something if you look at it upside down at a certain level in a certain direction and that kind of thing, the large majority of of buyers are not going to notice that or care. So don't get too hung up about it. I know it can be really annoying and drive you crazy if you are trying to like work on that one spot over and over and you just can't seem to get it. I would say either take a step away from it and then come back to it and try and objectively assess whether that is an issue and if you can just move forward with it as is. And or maybe you need to try out a different product on that piece because certain species of wood or certain materials just work better with certain top coats. So it might require a little bit of experimentation and the more projects that you do, the easier it will get and the more you'll develop a style of your own. So just don't worry, okay? I've been there too. And I still am sometimes. And the only other type of top coat that I will typically use on a piece is sometimes if I'm working on a piece and it is sanded, scraped, stripped, and then sanded smooth, and I want to kind of keep it that raw, natural wood. Usually this is more for like vintage pieces that have a really rich feel to them already, and I just want to kind of lean into that a little bit. I'll use a clear wax. For that, I will use a wax brush. Most paint companies will have specifically a wax brush. I usually like one that has a short handle so I can basically just like um, fist it, (laughs) like put it in my fist and just like kind of really get in there with it because the wax is definitely a thicker consistency and you want to work it a little bit to get some friction in there to warm up the wax so it's a lot more malleable and you can work it into the wood grain. And so a thick, densely packed wax brush I find works best for that. And I usually work in circles with it along the whole piece. I'll let it sit for a little bit and then I'll go back with a microfiber cloth or a blue shop towel or shop rag, lint free specifically you don't want things to get messy and I will go through and wipe away any excess and then if I want it to be a little bit more glitzy or like have a little bit more of a sheen to it versus having it be more matte then I'll buff that in a little bit more and basically the more you buff a wax the more there will be a sheen to it. And again, when I'm going through and I'm buffing it or I'm wiping away the excess, I'm going from end to end on the piece so that I can get the best finish. And I'm kind of overlapping my strokes with the cloth a little bit as well. And then I'm looking at it at different angles to see if there's any spots that I missed or that look like they could use a little bit more work. And something you may not know about me is I love little motivational messages. They always get me fired up and I keep a running list of ones that are especially catchy or speak to me in the notes app on my phone. 
And I end every podcast episode with one that I've noted down over the years in hopes that you leave our time here each week feeling inspired, motivated, and ready to take on whatever may come your way this week. This week's Mel's motivational message is leaders are readers. You read to succeed. Again, totally corny, I know, but I think it's so true. I always talk about the fact how so many people do not do any reading for pleasure post-schooling. You know, you might have some things that you have to read at work or whatever, but the large majority of people aren't just picking up a book about something that might interest them or might be educational to them or might help to better them in some way as adults. And I was that way as well up until a couple of years ago. I think I needed a few years after I was done university and stuff to like let my brain just chill because... <laughs> You're doing so many readings every single day and all this stuff that might not be super interesting to you. So I think I needed my brain to have some time to like just relax. But after that, I started getting back into reading, which really was something that I loved growing up. I would go to the library and get like a stack. And by a stack, I mean like 15 books of like, I don't know, the Babysitter's Club and those kinds of things. And I would just whip through those in like a week and I absolutely loved it. It was a great pastime and especially now when we spend so much time in front of a screen and on our phones, I think now more than ever taking up reading or getting back into it is such a useful thing to do. I know that some people will just like use a e-reader and they're in front of a screen anyways. I tend to prefer an actual book or an audiobook. If you're someone who likes podcasts, think about audiobooks as well, because that's a great opportunity to learn something new and to knock some books off of your list that you may have been acquiring over time. But since I started kind of leaning into it more, I have made one of my New Year's resolutions every year to finish a certain number of books. Last year in 2022, I got through 13 books. And this year, we still got a couple of weeks left in the year that I'm hoping to get through a couple more, but I'm at 22. So I've really had the commitment to it. I've also had a lot more time over the last couple of years being self-employed to be able to work that into my day. But that's not to say that you couldn't switch out a couple hours scrolling TikTok or Facebook or Instagram or sitting in front of the TV watching Netflix or reality TV and instead pick up a book and read that for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. Find something that really interests you and that you can get immersed in and it won't feel like work and you won't notice the amount of time that has gone by. It just might take a little bit of work to figure out what your genre of choice is. I'm currently in a James Patterson phase, which isn't necessarily educational in any way, shape, or form, but they're good like murder mystery kind of style books. And I'm working my way through the Alex Cross series and I am obsessed. If you have any recommendations for things that I should add to my list to read, please feel free to send me a message. I also found a Goodreads kind of end of the year compilation that I'm going to be doing at the end of the year once I have gone through all of the books that I will read for this year that goes over my top three books, number of pages read, average book length, how many books I read, and my highest rated book. So stay tuned to my Instagram and Facebook stories to see that. And I will also post the template for it so you can snag that and post your own as well. And if you do so, please be sure to tag me so again I can grow my list of things to read because eventually I'm going to run out of this series. I'm going to need something else. All right, that's it for now. I appreciate your time and I will catch you guys next week.